Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Episode number 37. I'm going to do my best today to keep this episode to one topic and one topic only. And I've actually struggled with being able to articulate my thoughts on this in an efficient and effective manner or in a streamlined manner that makes sense actually even to myself. I've started to, I tried to write about this and I actually answered this as part of the Q and a from episode number 36. And I essentially rambled on for about 30 minutes and I deleted it from when I was uploading it, the software before I upload it to the server. I just didn't, I didn't feel like I had done a good enough job of articulating my opinion, which everything that follows in this episode is obviously my opinion based off of my experiences through my own two eyes, agree, disagree, Whichever one it may be on that point, let's just all agree that it's okay to have differing opinions. It doesn't mean you're a douchebag. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. And it's okay to explore other people's beliefs and other people's ideas. I actually think you should seek that out so you can get a better understanding of the depth of your own belief and your own ideas. And maybe you'll learn something about yourself. So I might say some things in this episode that you might not agree with. I might say some things that you don't like and you're free to react however you want to. If you want to lash out on social media, lash out on social media. Don't expect a response from me though. If you want to engage with me and ask questions and have a reasonable and articulate discussion, by all means, let's do it. And I have no idea how long this episode is going to be. I'm going to try to keep it together, but let's talk about, let's talk about guns. Let's talk about guns in our society Let's talk about school shootings and what it means to actually be an expert in that environment. So here we go. Episode number 37, The Children of the Gun. Let's do it. Okay, I got the red smoke. Gun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, wait a minute, give it to me, I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. The question that started this ramble was, or is, with all of the recent talk about gun control and gun violence, how do I educate my kids about guns, gun safety, objectivity, etc.? I would prefer to actually, when I look at this question, I want to go in the opposite direction. I want to start with objectivity, and then I'll end with talking about how I educate my children about guns or how we treat guns in our household because the answer to that is very simple. And if I were just to answer this portion of the question, I th- it would take maybe three minutes. My approach to it is, is very simple. But when I look at this question, the thing that just blasts off the piece of paper that I have it written down on is objectivity. I personally believe that as a country we have a severe problem with objectivity. I feel like emotions are just driving the train down the track, which is okay as long as you have objectivity's hands on the wheel, but I don't think we have that anymore. I think that we have arrived at a place where discussion, there's not even a medium for discussion, and I'll get into that in a minute, but even if there were a medium I don't know if there's an appetite for it because people just want to hear what they believe and they want to be surrounded by people who parrot what they say. Now, again, these, this is my opinion and, and this entire episode is going to be probably highly opinion based. And if you don't like it, turn it off. I would turn it off right now because quite frankly, it's probably not going to get any better. The question about guns and our society and gun violence and shootings of any kind and specifically shootings in schools it it's a very layered and complex question and issue the question that was asked is very layered and the issue in and of itself is exponentially more complex than a sentence on a piece of paper and i want to start with the things that i don't know really anything about or i would be the first person to admit that i am not an expert in in any way shape or form I'm not an expert on the Second Amendment. I'm not an expert on legislation or the legislative process. I'm not an expert on the 
root cause of violence. I mean, I can't speak to it from the level of somebody who understands the psyche, uh, you know, a psychiatrist or a psychologist or somebody who has really studied the root cause issues of things that could drive people to this. And I'm actually, I'm not an expert on gun violence in general. What type of guns are most prevalent in society, statistics on gun violence, locations on gun violence. I'm not, I'm not an expert in those things. And I say that because in my opinion, to be an expert or to have expertise, it requires two things. One is a knowledge base. And I would say a very, if you're going to call yourself an expert, you need to have a robust knowledge base on the topic with which you are speaking. And the second part of that is experience. You have to have some experience in the pool that you're supposedly mentally or philosophically lifeguarding, that you're going to claim as your own and hold as your intellectual property. You need to have spent some time in that pool. And if you're deficient in any one of those areas, in my opinion, your self-titled expertise or your title of being an expert is open for at least discussion and debate. So other than the objectivity, which like I stated in the intro is something that I believe that this country has an issue with currently, or maybe it's had that issue for a while and I haven't paid attention to it to the degree that I should. One of the, one of the key points that rubs me the wrong way when people discuss guns and shootings, specifically I'm going to narrow that down even further. I'm going to be talking a lot today about school shootings of which I have never been a part of. I have never been on the receiving end of a school shooting and I have never been on the action end of a school shooting. So I'm not saying that I'm an expert in school shootings, but I will say this for nearly 20 years of my life, weapons were my primary tool at work. I drilled and I trained and I practiced and I rehearsed and I used them in practical training environments and I used them in the real world. I studied their strengths, their weaknesses, and their limitations. So I would say I have a a good knowledge base when it comes to weapons in and of themselves. Obviously, I I would consider myself an expert on the ones that I had in my hands the most often, but when it comes to the actual use of weapons and weapon systems in general, I would like to think that I know what I'm talking about. So the knowledge base is there on the experience side of the house. I know of no other way to put this than I have shot and killed more people specifically with rifles than nearly anybody walking on the face of the earth today. And that's com- that comment's going to rub people the wrong way. And that's fine because they're probably taking that as me somehow trying to brag about my previous career or some backhanded way to puff up my chest. And if you take it like that, you're actually taking it in the exact opposite manner that I mean it. What I mean by saying that is it's not about how many people that I have been in violent confrontations with and ended their life. What it really means is that the vast majority of, Nearly everybody who is on the face of this planet never has to deal with that. And that's an amazing, beautiful thing. The odds and the stats could not be more in your favor. But a lot of people from that group with the odds and the stats in their favor who are claiming to be experts, quite frankly, are not. They might have a lot of knowledge, But I can tell you right now, the difference between a one-way paper range and a two-way live range is the exact same thing as trying to stand on one side of the Grand Canyon and broad jump to the other. You have to have the knowledge and experience, in my opinion, to really be able to understand what is happening in those environments. And so I'm going to dig in on something that I've heard from the leaders of the March for Our Lives movement. But before I do that, I want to be very clear about how I feel for the mar- about the March for Our Lives movement. The kids that are at the front of this, the forefront of this issue, who are the ones who are receiving the most media attention, I could not 
empathize more with the situation and environment that they survived at their school. It is an absolute worst nightmare scenario as a parent who has children. My oldest son is two and a half years younger than those kids, which is what I'm going to call them young adults at best, but I'm their kids. And I say that based off of how I was at that age. So I have those same fears and I have those same worries. I can only imagine being in that developmental phase of your life, having to survive something that violent and complex. And I'm glad that they have the platform that they have. I'll say right now, I don't want their platform to be taken from them. I'm glad that is an issue that is being brought to the forefront because even if nothing changes, I believe that the discussion and the debate is worthwhile and it's important. What bothers me about the movement is it, in my opinion, it highlights the failure of the parents. It highlights the failure of our society. And I know that there have been examples in past of younger individuals or younger generations leading the charge. And that's fine. And I hope that they achieve their end state. But to me, that means that we failed. I don't look to my children to point me in the right direction. What I do is I look back on my life And then I listen to what my children have to say about the world that they're living in because they are the experts of the world that they're growing up in. And I'll talk about that in a minute too. The differences that I, that I think are contributing to this, not causal, but I think they're contributing. You have to listen. And that's why I don't want these kids to lose their platform. They are the experts of growing up in the world that they're growing up in. Having said that, they don't have any expertise when it comes to anything outside of that. They're experts at being in high school. They're not politicians. They're not public figure figures, even though some of them have been growing. Uh, actually, probably some of them now would consider themselves to be public figures. But I look at them and I look at them as kids. It pisses me off that it takes kids to pull the next or the older generation along by the nose. It shouldn't be like that. We should be listening to them and helping them shepherd them along until they can get to a point where they can turn around and do the exact same thing to the younger generation. And again, that's my opinion. And that's what really irritates me about the movement. It's not the platform. It's not the message. It's the, where, where the, you know, we as parents failed these kids. We failed these kids. That's the way I look at it at the end of the day. And the second thing that bugs me, and this might just be me, but I have heard in multiple mediums, these kids refer to themselves at expert as experts in the shooting with which they survived. And that expertise drives their understanding of the changes in legislation that are going to solve this problem. So for one, one thing that really pisses me off is that I feel like we're looking for light switch solutions to a complex issue. This didn't happen overnight. These shootings didn't start overnight. But people seem to be under the impression that changing a few words on a piece of paper is going to instantaneously stop the flow of water from the spigot. And it doesn't work like that. So that's one piece of the puzzle that that bugs the hell out of me. The second one is, I want to hear from some of the students who actually survived the shooting. Now, everybody who went to that school, and this is going to sting a bit. If you attended that school but didn't encounter the shooter, I'm not going to say that you are not the survivor of a school shooting, because I think you are. But if you're going to sit up there and say on a national stage, on national media, that you are the expert because you look down the barrel of an AR-15, you better be damn sure that that actually happened. And what I'm not hearing a lot from are the people who are actually staring down the barrel of the gun. And I will say this. 17 minutes of your life, however excruciating and terrifying and scary it may be, doesn't make you an expert. Much like if you get into a car wreck, you are not an expert on vehicle safety. If you were to get into an airplane crash, the NTSB is not going to come to you for advice and expertise on aircraft safety. You might have experienced it, but I think you need to be really cautious getting up there and calling yourself an expert. Because the reality is, is that you are not. 
I really would like to hear what some of the other students have to say. I feel like, and I'm trying to remain, uh, remain objective in this myself, I'm trying to view this whole issue not from an emotional perspective, but from just an objective viewpoint. And I really feel like there is one narrative that is being driven down our throats, or that may, perhaps that's the wrong description. I feel like there is one narrative that is being reported on. And I don't, I can't think of a single situation in my life where there was one narrative that encapsulated everything or one explanation that encapsulated everything. I would like to hear from more people than just the students who have been thrust to the front of this movement. And maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm completely wrong in that. And what I will say is this, and I should have opened with this. I'm, I am absolutely open to having my mind changed on any of my beliefs on this topic. And like I said at the beginning, I consider myself to be an expert at very, very few things. And I will be the first to admit my lack of expertise and knowledge where it exists. But I just think that there is a little bit more to this story that could be covered better from a full spectrum approach instead of just a needle prick pointing at specifically one issue. And if I had to pick the one issue that I think that that is, it's guns. People are going after what they think is the light switch solution. If we can just fill in the blank with these guns, these things are going to stop. And I just don't believe that's the case. And the reason for that is, is that guns have been around for a really long time. I had access to guns when I was in high school. I know other people had access to guns when they were in high school as well. That doesn't mean that you went and you got the gun and you started somehow disconnecting in your brain or coming up with the solution to your issue or the rage or the, uh, the anger or uh, despair, whatever it may be. I don't understand. I, I don't know which one of those to apply to because I do not understand what drives people to do this. But if you arrive at the conclusion that the solution to your problem, whatever it may be, is to get a gun and go gun down your classmates, I mean, that, there's an issue there. And the issue isn't the gun. It's how did you get to that spot? And the difference between when I was growing up and now is not the access to the firearm itself. I truly feel that we are spinning our wheels and going to go absolutely nowhere until we broaden our gaze a little bit and start looking for the root cause of what's driving this as opposed to the symptom or the tool that these individuals choose. I'm not saying that there is no benefit from making those tools harder to get a hold of, and I'm, I'm, I completely support reasonable and responsible gun legislation, and I also support the Second Amendment. And I think you can do both of those things simultaneously. But I'm going to go back to, I, I'm trying to figure out what is the difference between when I was growing up and right now when my kids are growing up because it's not it's not the access to guns. When I was growing up, I went to high school from 1992 to 1996 and I saw violence. I mean not often, it wasn't a daily thing, but you know, seeing seeing fights was not I would say uncommon. And so I think back, I'm trying to think back about my experiences. And I know one key difference between the world that I grew up in and the world that my kids are growing up in, and it's and it's connectivity and the ability to to interact and interface with people in a consequence free environment. And what I mean by that is, is, when I was in high school, if I wanted to go and have an argument with somebody, or if I wanted to bully somebody, or if I wanted to just talk shit to somebody, I had to physically go and do it to their face. My only other options would be to try to figure out what that person's phone number was and then give them a call, or I guess I could have written them a letter, neither of which would have satisfied what I was probably trying to do in that moment, not that I did those things in high school. But the point being, if, if I was going to have that interaction, actually all of my interaction was based around the fact that I actually knew the people I was interacting with and it was face-to-face. -face. Like I said, the farthest away that I could get would be a telephone, but I had to know the person's number, so I still actually knew the person. And if a conversation went south, 
or there was the intent of or, you know, aggressive intent in the conversation, there were consequences face to face in the real world because of that real world communication. And I look back to my parents' generation and the generation before theirs, and it actually gets closer and closer and closer. Meaning, you know, at some point, you know, the telephone hadn't been invented yet, but guess what? There was still violence. Uh, and then, you know, we went from rotary telephones to cell phones in my parents' age. And then it, you know, it rapidly accelerated. I think I was at the very uh, groundswell of everything becoming electronic. I think the highest speed thing I had in high school was a pager. And if uh, if you remember those days, shout out to the to the pager. <laughs> But again, I guess I could have paged somebody and had them call me, and then I could have talked smack to them. But the reality is I had to do it in a face-to-face, consequenced environment. And if I look at what my the environment that my kids are growing up in, if I had to say it was defined by one thing, I would say it was defined by their ease of access to people that they actually don't know. And it's in my opinion, a very dangerous environment to grow up in because it's it plants the seeds for the detachment between your ears of consequence versus no consequence, which, and again, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I think if you take that far enough down a timeline and you live in that world and, and you grow up in that world, I think that that could have some effect in your the way that your brain works and a decision to think that, I'm, you know, I'm just going to go grab a gun and I'm just going to go to go to my school. It, what, what, you know, what does it matter? Nothing else that I do, you know, has any real world consequence. I can understand to a degree how that line gets very, very gray. My kids are connected to everybody. And when I sit down and I think about it, and I was taking some notes again today for like the fourth time to try to attempt this over the last week, I'm blown away by how connected they are from an electronic perspective and how disconnected they are from a personal or emotional or consequential perspective. So my two oldest sons have phones. They have the ability. I mean, we got them under the guise of being able to communicate with them and rapidly they start adding apps that are games, but also have the ability to communicate. Then Snapchat comes around then Instagram comes around Facebook Fill in the blank. Before you know it, you have the full suite and complement of ability to communicate with people at every corner of the round globe. And if you have kids that are my age or you have kids that are in this generation, which they have now titled the school shooting generation or the mass shooting generation, which it's not. I think that in and of itself is irresponsible. And if you choose to define yourself by those terms, you are being incredibly irresponsible. I think the more accurate description of my kids' generation is the avatar generation. They have the ability to go into these devices and into these worlds and create a persona and live through that persona and interact with people in violent environments, in sexually charged environments. And if you really want to scare yourself, if you have kids that are playing video games that have multiplayer options or a multiplayer gaming mode, go down and listen to the audio that takes place in those chat rooms. I would at best describe it as very aggressive shit talking. And there is a lot of it. And sometimes I'll go down and I'll just, you know, I kind of sneak in behind my son because I'm trying to, I mean, I, I feel like I'm rapidly losing my ability to keep track of everything that he's doing. And I want to one from love, but also from fear. So I'll just go in there and I'll just, I try to sit down and I just try to listen. I just want to see how my my kids interact with the world when they don't realize that somebody's looking over their shoulder and what ends up happening. I hear them engaging in the exact same kind of talk occasionally, not always, you know, and I'll, and I'll tap them on the shoulder and I'll interrupt them. And it's not to, I'm not trying to get him in trouble, but I have questions. And my first question is, do you know the people that you're talking to? Like, do you actually know them? Like, oh yeah, it's, you know, Dane or Bob or whatever to make up a name. And 
But that's not the answer to the question that I'm looking for. I didn't say, do you know the name that they chose to give you, whether it's their real name or not, but do you actually know this person? And the answer is more often than not, no. They do play with some people they go to school with, but most of the time they're playing with unknown individuals who are again, experiencing this world through some avatar. You know, I ask them where they live and, you know, do you know where they live? And no, no, I never really thought to ask. It's like, well, okay, then why are you telling your dude, these people like, you know, earmuffs for kids, if there's any kids listening to this, you know, why are you telling these people or why do I hear you saying, oh, I'm going to kill you? You know, I'm going to kill you, motherfucker. I'm, I, you know, I'm kicking your ass. How'd you like that shit? Like, that's the stuff that I hear occasionally, not only my kids saying, but rampant vocabulary. And the answer is, oh, I don't know. It's not that big of a deal. That's, that's the answer. Like, they don't think twice about talking like that. Why? Because there's no real world consequence. Snapchat, same thing. In in my household, we've had an issue with Snapchat, with one of my kids making a comment that was very pointed and it was it was mean. And the individual that it was directed to took it exactly as the meaning that he intended it. And it was it was negative, and it had, and you know, and it impacted that person in the real world, and it also got circulated, and I and I constantly reinforced to my sons, anything that you ever type, and any picture that you ever send, you have to assume that it's going to be used outside of its intended audience and outside of the context with which you are sending it. It's a scary world in the. In my opinion, it's a very scary world in the instant messaging, the Snapchat, because again, you have access to these people. And if you, and if you want to look into the impact that it, this has had, do a Google search, Google search on the number of teenage kids who have killed themselves because they've been bullied in an environment like Snapchat. And what ends up happening is it, it becomes this environment where it's really easy to pile on. Right? What I mean, yeah, yeah, you suck. Just type that in and send it off to somebody you don't even know who's probably already having a bad day anyway. Maybe made a mistake in that digital realm like I was talking about that sent a picture or typed something that they probably regret the second that it got sent. But now everybody's piling on and there's no escape because there's no boundaries. And then I look at something like Facebook, which again gives you access to, you know, every corner of this round globe access to people you'll never meet. And it actually highlights, in my opinion, Facebook to me highlights how powerful and how insidious these online ecosystems actually are. The best example that I can give is that individuals and generations of people who grew up in the environments that I talked about earlier, where everything was face to face. And what happens when you have to deal face to face? You get social skills, you get communication skills, in the back of your mind, you're thinking about the consequences of your actions. You're thinking about the consequences consequences of your words because it could be immediate in nature. So people who grew up with those skills and in an environment where you couldn't interface and interact with people all over the world are literally setting the worst example of behavior and communication for the younger generations. And they're doing it rapidly. Yelling, screaming, insulting, threatening, you're a moron, you're an idiot. None of these people would behave this way in, in public. Or the example that I like to think of, anytime that I'm getting ready to say or post anything on any electronic medium of any kind, the litmus test that I use is, would I say this in an elevator? Face-to-face -face with somebody, no barrier, in a confined environment. The effect it has that... Facebook has on adults and the power that it has on people who are brand new to this system and how fast they shed any of those layers of humanity or compassion or patience or tolerance. And that's from people who grew up learning the exact opposite. If it can happen that fast to the adults and they are setting that example, how is it even possible to grow up in that environment and have an understanding of the difference between the real world and the electronic world and what is acceptable to say and what is not acceptable to say? I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think it grays the lines 
in the brains of people who are still developing. And like I said, I don't think it's the cause. I am so short on horsepower between the ears to figure out the actual root causes. But I do think that this has an impact. It's not making anything any easier for an environment that is already difficult to grow up in. And speaking of that environment, when I listen to these kids, whether it be the leaders of the March for Our Lives movement, or when I sit down and I have conversations with my own sons, which I have had quite a few of recently about this particular issue, and my questions are based around, what are, what are your teachers talking to you about? What is your school administration talking to you about? And how do you feel about this issue? When I listen to my kids and when I listen to, like I said, the leaders of the March for Our Lives movement, what I hear them saying is that they're scared. And I think that they should be. And if we have addressed an issue or identified an issue that is a legitimate threat, what we need to do is actually take objective action against it. And again, this is where I think that the narrative has either been hijacked accidentally or people who proclaim to be experts are basically talking out of their ass because they're not. The best example that I can give from something that I've seen in my own life as to how I think we should be behaving, right? Because right now this topic seems to be the soup du jour. It seems to be the, the, the topic of the day. And it's going to continue to be the topic of the day until we actually take some actions that are going to impact it. And if to do that, we have to look at it objectively. We have to look at... I would say two things, the root cause and then the physical steps that we can take if we believe it to truly be an issue. The example that I'll give is 9-11, not the actual attack itself, but the changes in the airport environment post 9-11 versus pre. So I remember traveling pre 9-11 and it was a pretty laissez-faire evolution. I, I remember when I was uh, probably, I don't know how old it was, uh, probably before being a teenager. But I remember my dad used to roll around with this Swiss Army knife in his pocket. And we would go to the airport and he'd throw it in the bin. And, uh, you know, we'd go through and they'd open the blade and they'd look at it and, like, cool. Like, you know, th- it was like there was some ridiculous re- uh, regulation as to how long the blade could possibly be. It was a couple inches long or something like that. Point being, a knife on an airplane wasn't identified at that time to be a threat. And then you go on to the actual aircraft itself. And I'm sure people who travel pre-9-11 remember this. The cockpit door was open half the time. Like, kids could roll up there like, hey, what's going on, Captain? Ah, you want to wear my hat? You know, here's this button and that one. And it was the opposite, the exact opposite of the environment that it is in today. And what changed that? As a society, we identified that there was a viable threat that had to have action taken against it. Now... I don't want to get into 9-11. I don't, I don't care if you think it's a conspiracy or not. It's not to germane to the point that I'm trying to make. I'm trying to talk about the difference between security at airports pre-9-11 and security at airports modern day because they don't look anything like they used to. And there's two phases to that. There is the phase in airport security that is trying to screen and process and do everything they possibly can to keep somebody from getting a weapon onto the aircraft. And then the aircraft in and of itself has also been hardened. And I think that that's a very accurate juxtaposition to schools. We have to do everything we possibly can to keep somebody from getting a weapon onto campus. Because if you get a weapon onto campus and somebody comes there gunned up, it's too late. And then you're going to have to rely on the security measures of the school whether they be physical security members or not security me- physical security measures, meaning hardened doors that are able to lock, control access points, and a response team. But the goal is not to allow that to happen in the first place. And I'm not saying we need to create a TSA for schools. I, I think the efficacy of the TSA could be argued, but the airport environment has completely changed, at least the screening process and 
how things are treated on the aircraft. The aircraft itself was hardened. If we're going to have a march for our lives and we really want to do something that is going to make our children safer, if our society really believes in this, the effort would be on school safety. The narrative would be, what can we do to make our schools safer? It would not be, write these words down on a piece of paper to change laws that those who are intent on killing others don't care about in the first place. I went to my kid's school a week ago, and I was there with my wife, and as we were walking in, I was kind of just looking around, Yeah, and, and as soon as we went inside of the school, I made the comment to my wife. Now, actually, I take that back. <laughs> I made the comment as we were leaving because I, God forbid that somebody overhear a comment that was not intended as a threat and the next thing you know, they, they lose their shit. So I, as we were leaving, I made the comment, this school is completely vulnerable to having somebody come and attack. And if we're serious about this threat, if you're actually serious about saving lives in the school environment, that's what has to be addressed. And if you look at the airport, I mean, what do they do? There's active measures. I'm not positive of this, but if airport security was smart, they would have a closed circuit TV system that is looking as far away from the airport as can possibly be that they can manage and watch to identify a threat as soon as possible. Then there's security measures at the airport. There is screening and restricted entry points. There are security personnel at the airport. There's restricted items. Is there a little bit of an invasion of privacy at the airport? Yes, there is. Why? For the safety of everybody there, for the greater good. And again, I'm not willing to make that, or I'm not ready to have that argument in this moment because there's pros and cons to both. Is it a violation of your privacy to some degree? Yeah. Is it an increase in your safety in some degree? Yeah. And you're either comfortable with that or you're not. But all of those things didn't exist pre-9-11. So we're either serious about this issue or we're not. It's all based around keeping somebody off that plane with the means or ability to do something that could injure other people. And that's how we have to view our school safety. If we're going to do that, guns are one of the last things that we should be talking about, in my opinion. We should be talking about and funding and doing everything that we can programs to find solutions to interrupt the decision-making process from somebody thinking that the solution is to take a weapon of any kind to a campus. And in my opinion, that starts with talking about mental health and how we address mental health in this society. You want to scare yourself again? Go on to Google and look at the number of people, just in general, who are drugged up. And it could be uppers and it could be downers, but something taking something that is changing the split piece soup between your ears at a chemical level. So there's the mental health aspect. I think the way that we medicate that. And I also think we have to take a really hard look in the mirror of what's going on in the American family, if that's even a term anymore. You know, the stats that I was reading recently, you know, 50% of kids are growing up in a single parent home. Divorce rate is over 50%. 80% of kids, if not more, are seeing mostly their father one time per year. So single parent homes, majority of the time, the mother is the one who has custody of the kids. And I don't think that, I don't know if that's right or wrong. I don't know enough about that, but not having the input of both and not having the family structure of both, to me, that starts the nucleus of this problem. We have to look at the nucleus. We have to stop just addressing the symptom because if somebody makes it to a school with a gun, the only strategy that you have is brace for impact. It's too late at that point. Now, and another thing I've heard recently is, you know, we have a lot of vets. So what we should do is we should put vets to school and arm them and they're prepared to defend the schools. And I'll say this. My default position on being a veteran, one, is that it's a privilege. And two, all service is honorable. But I will say right after that, comma, that all service is also different. And I'll use 
my career field had I not successfully made it through the SEAL pipeline and what that would have looked like. So I joined the Navy in 96. I went into boot camp. Before I went to BUDS, I had to pick an occupational specialty from a list that was available from job specialties that would allow me to go to BUDS. I chose OS, which is Operations Specialist, which is a radar scope operator. Had I followed that career path, I would have been in the CIC or Combat Information Center on a ship, uh, like watch Top Gun where they're drawn all over the with like grease pencils and stuff. I'm, I'm hoping they're still smoking and wearing aviator glasses in there, although I don't think they ever did. Highly technology-based environment. I'm sure it will continue to become even more so. And I could have done 20 years until retirement age in that environment. My exposure to weapons would have been minimal, if at all. My exposure to security of installations or response to anybody or engaging anybody with a weapon would have been minimal, if at all. But I would have been a veteran. Just because you're a vet does not mean that you are qualified to pick up a gun and go stand security at a school. So I know that people are very patriotic and they think that they, you know, they want to engage the veteran community. But you're talking about something that you are not an expert in. And when people start doing that, bad ideas start coming to the surface. Maybe 20% of vets experience direct combat or have a role that is involved in direct combat. And guess what it's at, you know, when somebody comes with a school to a weapon, you're now engaged in direct combat. Could you train that other 80% to do that job? Maybe. But what you're going to find is the vast majority of them are not suited for it. Again, light switch solution to a complex problem that will not solve itself overnight. I do believe that we're going to have to fight our way out of this issue. And I hope it doesn't come down to throwing lead down hallways in schools. That's, that's not what I mean. What I mean is these issues built over time and we're going to have to beat them back over time. But if we don't do it objectively, nothing, absolutely nothing is going to change. And so, like I said at the beginning, I'll close with how I deal in my own household with guns because I know I've rambled on for far too long. And honestly, I don't even know if I made a single articulate point. But as far as in my own house goes, the first thing is there's no mystique about about guns. If my kids throughout the course of their life, or as they continue on in the course of their life, if they want to handle a weapon, all they have to do is ask. And I don't have like weapons laying around, but they have been exposed to in around weapons their entire life, treated safely and appropriately for their age and experience the entire time. But if they ever have a question, then say, hey, Dad, can I hold a gun? Or can I check out your rifle? The answer is, of course. But before that, what we do is we verbalize every single time weapon safety. And I have them explain to me their understanding of weapon safety. And, you know, it starts with always treating a weapon as if it's loaded. Even if they know it's not, they never put their finger on the trigger unless they intend to actually fire the weapon or kill something that it is pointed at. They always keep it pointed in a safe direction. And, and there is no slack when it comes to the safety protocol in our house. If, if there's ever a time that I'm going to come down on them extremely hard, it's going to be if they have a weapon or if we're talking about weapons because mistakes with them are permanent. Either, there's no take backs with a, with a bullet going down range. I also cover stuff like, hey, what do you do if you find a gun? You know, and the answer is to that is go get an adult. Uh, what do you do if you know of or see somebody or one of your friends is playing with a gun? You get the hell out of there and you go find an adult. You know, I, I talk with them about this, even though they know the answers every single time we go over this. Like my sons have a 22 rifle and they go and they'll practice shooting their rifle. And every time before I hand them their gun, we go through this and I'll sit out there with them a little bit and make sure that their weapon handling skills are safe and that they have a good understanding. And then I watch them. They're under supervision. I would say at the end of the day, my kids see weapons, specifically guns, for what they actually are. They're a tool that contain amazing potential and kinetic energy and terrible 
potential and kinetic energy. And the difference between those two things is the individual that is holding it in their hand. If you give me a weapon, your life will never be in danger unless you're a sociopath or a psychopath that also has a weapon that intends to do harm to others. And in that situation, I'm going to burn you to the ground without thinking twice. But it's not the weapon that is the danger. It is the person who is wielding it. And the only way you'll get to that point of understanding is either through experience yourself or doing your absolute best to maintain your objectivity. Most of the people that I hear passionately, passionately voicing their opinions about weapons and gun laws and restrictions have almost no experience, if not no experience with weapons themselves. And they fail to realize their lack of understanding. You know, I don't know anything about the space shuttle, but personally, I would like to think that it should be painted pink. And NASA doesn't reach out to me and ask me what I think because I don't know shit about the space shuttle. And I don't voice that opinion to NASA because I don't know anything about it. It doesn't change how much I believe in that color or how much I want that change to be. I just personally don't voice that opinion because I realize my lack of knowledge and experience. I'm not trying to tell people they don't have the right to express themselves. But if you're emotionally expressing yourself on an issue that you have no experience or expertise with, you're probably anything other than objective. And it's, in my opinion, part of the issue that is driving this country off the rails. And now, and I'll shut up before I go down the rabbit hole of going another direction. So hopefully I answer that question. I'm glad I took a little bit of time to think through my response to this. And I'm glad there was a little bit of time separating my response from the actual events in and of themselves. And the reality is, regardless of what I think and regardless of what other people think, or what other people's, well, wow, great English, regardless of what other people think, nothing is going to change until as a society that we can agree that it's an issue and then take action on it, like we did at the airports in 9-11. And that's all I got. Thank you, everybody, again, for supporting the podcast. Uh, what's new and coming up? I have absolutely no idea what's new and coming up. The stickers are kind of new. Those things are almost gone. Got a couple new T-shirt ideas I'm kicking around. If you've reached out to me and you've said, hey, I want to do a, or you would like to get a hunting version of a Claret Hot shirt, I hear you. All right, I'm working on it. There will be a hunt camp version of a shirt, and there'll be a special prize if you actually wear the shirt and go hunting and are able to harvest an animal. I have no idea what that is, but that's going to exist. And what else? I think that's it. I'm on the road. Going to be with Senor Dudley here coming up next week, going on my first turkey hunt. Pretty much have no idea what to expect. All I know is that turkeys can see really, really, really well, and you got to hide in the shadows. And that's about it. So I have no doubt that there will be podcasts from the road. Thanks to everybody who's been reaching out to me through either the contact on the website or writing me a review on iTunes. And as always, if it's good, bad, or ugly, send it to me. Write the review. I don't care. I'll look at both positive and negative objectively. My goal is to build the podcast. and Actually, my goal is to have as much fun with it as I can. That's why I started it in the first place, and I'm having a blast doing it. But if there's things I can do to make it better, hit me up. And I think that is about it. Next Monday, episode 38.